I'm Shachar Razani, and in the news, Israel-Ukraine relations amid Ukrainian criticism of Israel. In a post to its Facebook page, Ukraine's embassy in Israel wrote that the so-called neutrality of Israel's government is considered as a clear pro-Russian position. In response, Israel's foreign ministry summoned Kiev's envoy in Israel for reprimand. In between Ukrainians' critique of Israel and Ukrainians' first lady's visit to the country earlier this month, what is happening in this complex triangle of the Russia-Israel-Ukraine relations? Laser Berman is a Time of Israel's diplomatic correspondent and Christian affairs reporter. Today, he joins us all the way from Jerusalem, Israel, to enlighten us on this important issue and clear some of the haze. Laser, welcome and thank you so much for joining us on JBS. Thanks for having me, Shachar. Good to be here. Um, first of all, let me dive straight in. In your recent report in the Times of Israel, you mentioned this blistering critique of uh, Israel by the Ukraine. What was that all about? Sure. So we woke up Sunday morning to this Facebook post, actually, from the Ukrainian embassy in Israel. And I, it surprised me and it surprised some other people because it seemed after months of some pretty harsh statements out of Kiev and from the ambassador here, that under the Netanyahu government, relations had actually gotten better. Um, there were some really concrete examples of this. We remember in February, Foreign Minister Eli Cohen went to Kiev. I was with him. We took an overnight train from Poland into Kiev. We spent the day there. He met with Foreign Minister Kuleba. He met with Zelensky. And then we took a train out. He pledged $200 million in loan guarantees. He pledged the civilian... Uh, air warning system to give them better, better, uh, a better warning, more time to get into shelters, more, more precise warnings. Um, and it seemed that things were on the up and up. If you remember last week, Olena Zolenska, who's the first lady of Vladimir Zelensky's wife, was in Israel, right. met with the president, met with the first lady, met with Netanyahu's wife. So it seemed like there was more understanding from both sides. There was probably even cooperation on the Iranian file. And then we wake up to this, like you said, blistering, blistering critique saying that Israel was essentially closely cooperating with Moscow, that Cohen's visit was fruitless, that Israeli diplomats who attend Russia Day celebrations in Israel have no moral compass, more or less, um, and that Israeli leaders are giving a pass to officials in Moscow, including Putin, including uh, Sergei Lavrov, who use anti-Semitism. Um, you know, as a matter of course, and and that that uh, statement really infuriated Israel. Uh, Israeli officials told me that you know it seems like in Kiev they've kind of lost a sense of reality, and and this is out of the blue, and that was reflected, as you said, by the summons. So that's going to happen on July third. Eliza Bin Noon, who's the um, the political director at the foreign ministry, someone you might know well. Uh, is she's going to have a conversation. It's not a reprimand. It's a clarification state, uh, conversation, but it certainly reflects uh, this frustration from Israel at Ukrainian frustration uh, back toward Jerusalem. L so, Laser, based yes. on your extensive experience, and you mentioned you accompanied the foreign minister on his visit, this is highly uncommon, undiplomatic language in general to use um, on the on the side of an envoy in a, in a host country. How do you explain this? Is this a personal issue? Is this a manifestation of distress? How do you view these uh, these comments in the way that they are being uh, conveyed? It's certainly not diplomatic. Um, what Ukrainian officials, especially Ambassador Yevgen Kornichuk says is, listen, we're in a war. We don't have time and we don't have the, um, the privilege of being diplomatic. We are trying to save lives. He has stormed out of meetings. He's, he's used all sorts of language. And if you remember Zelensky himself in some of his statements, in some of his speeches with Israelis, there was, I believe it was a speech toward, to Hebrew University students. And he did all sorts of comparisons with the Holocaust, which usually um, Israel and Jews frown upon. Obviously, he is Jewish himself, so he gets some leeway. But these are certainly statements that that are, are far beyond uh, diplomatic language. Again, they say that they're in a war. They're fighting for their lives. Ukrainians are dying. And they need Israeli technology, they need Israeli support, they need Israeli intelligence, and they certainly don't want to see, um, you know, political diplomatic meetings between Israel and Russian officials, which which have been going on. You know, there's there's no denying that. Um, so I think that is 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 the reason behind it. I think also there are 
uh, senior advisors to Zelensky who personally might have a bone to pick with Israel who don't really want to see a uh, stable Ukraine-Israel relationship. And I think that also might be a source of some of these recent statements. You know, um, you mentioned, um, you know, the the complexities, the considerations that Israel has to take. In a recent discussion at the Knesset Foreign Relations Committee, the representative for Israel's foreign ministry mentioned those intricate set of considerations when dealing with this issue. For the sake of our viewers, um, in this you know, terrible haze. Can you elaborate a little bit about what are those considerations that in, in Israel's unique predicament that it needs to take into account in the balance in its situation between Russia and the Ukraine? Sure. So let's do the easy one. Why, what considerations does Israel have to be on the side of Ukraine? I think those ones are obvious. Uh, Israel sees itself as a like-minded member of Western democracies, affluent liberal democracies. That's where its political philosophies are. That's where its closest allies are. Um, and that's where it models itself. So it's, the Ukraine issue is certainly the priority right now for the United States, for the EU, especially for the UK. Um, so that's not hard to understand uh, that moral issue. So what needs to be explained is why Israel has not stepped forward like, like these Western countries. I think, first of all, it must be said, that besides North America, Europe, and I guess Japan, the rest of the world has not gone along with Western democracies, right? Turkey, nope. Uh, India, democracy is certainly not there as well. They certainly have a robust relationship. And Israel's new allies in the region, the Gulf states, um, Morocco, they haven't joined sanctions against Russia, you know? So, so Israel, in some ways, this reflects the fact that Israel is a Middle Eastern country and is also um, a Western country that that there's this uh, tension, right. specifically with Russia. Uh, since 2015, Russia has had not a ton of troops, but has had significant capabilities in Syria to protect its interests there. And, and the most worrying for Israel, not any sort of ground troops, but um, air defense and, and pilots. Now, Israel is far more powerful than Russia in the region. There's no question. If Israel really needed to, they could they could drive all that out and destroy it. But Israel doesn't want to get into that. Israel wants to have freedom of action as much as possible. They want to continue this deconfliction mechanism, military to military deconfliction me mechanism over Syria so that Russia can pursue its interests and it will stand back when Israel tries to keep uh, Iran from opening a new front in Syria. We know what they've done in Lebanon with Hezbollah. They aspire to do the same thing in Syria, but Israel has been successful in keeping them from doing that. And I think Russia has no interest in seeing Iran get in the way of Syria's reconstruction and start a fight um, with Israel. So that is what is cited by Israel. There's also so, the so issue. So you're saying, you're saying the Russians have the power to interfere or, you know, uh, uh, interfere with Israel's intentions to do the same in, in the region. And that's a major consideration there as far as air defense, um, Israel's freedom to operate in the airspace and beyond. Yes, yes. I mean, if Israel really needed to, they, like I said, they could absolutely drive any Russian forces out. There's no question about that. There's a historic, for those of, of your, your your viewers who, who like history, during the War of Attrition in the 70s and uh, during the Yom Kippur War, Israel had no problem killing Soviet pilots and even uh, conducting air ambushes when right. they were getting in the way of Israel's operations against uh, SAM uh, air defense batteries. But that was Israel's fight. And there's no reason for Israel to make its life even more difficult in Syria for someone else's fight. So that's one consideration. Another consideration is the fact that there are hundreds of thousands of Jews in Russia. Um, and that is a consideration. They certainly could be punished by the Kremlin in certain ways. We've seen that the Kremlin has put pressure on, on the Jewish agency with threats to close it in Russia. Right. Aliyah more difficult. I think that has to be a consideration. Um, and, and people can argue whether you know that is enough of a moral consideration, but I think that is certainly there as well. Also, in the land of real politic, it is for sure. Absolutely. And and you know, Western countries will will criticize Israel for being uh, transact transactional here or real politic. You could take the same um, comparison and put it on Iran. These countries, you know, these same countries that want Israel to cut relationships with Russia still have relationships with Iran because it's not their major threat. Their major threat is Russia. Our major threat is Iran. So we look at it differently. It's perfectly normal and acceptable. And I should also say, listen, Russia is a powerful country. It's one of the most powerful countries in the world. It has a very long, large military. Its military has definitely underperformed. It still is a major nuclear power a major energy power. There's no reason for Israel to start 
um, you know, putting that to to to, to um, get on the wrong side of that unnecessarily. Um, so what it has tried to do is is find that balance to support Ukraine rhetorically and with humanitarian aid, but to draw a line at at at, at weapons and, and defensive measures that they have asked for. Um, when it comes to you know Iran's role, and you mentioned extensively, we understand Israel's unique predicament, but Iran plays a significantly negative role in this sense. You know, experimenting, according to reports, all sorts of drones and other killing machineries in the Ukraine on Ukrainian citizens. With many people in Israel viewing this as a as a great pilot test before they try the same weaponry against Israel in a future conflict. And at the same time, you know, the relations between Russia and Iran uh, in the backdrop of the nuclear negotiations with Iran, how do you see those interests as far as Iran and Israel are concerned? Because on the face of it, I have to tell you, Laser, on the face of it, if Iran is experimenting against Ukrainian citizens with such weaponry, doesn't it make sense for Israel to be there and counter those measures or no? It certainly makes sense for intelligence to be shared and you can rest assured that Western intelligence agencies with whom Israel has excellent relations are watching that, and Israel's watching that as well, uh, for sure. If Israel, if, if if you're talking about Israel putting capabilities in Ukraine, listen, it, it's more complex. Iron Dome, certainly Israel doesn't have extra Iron Domes. If it was going to sell Iron Dome to a country and it has, it creates a separate long-term production line and, and creates it for them. There's also the issue that Israel cites, and, and Netanyahu cited it this morning in his Wall Street Journal interview, I that... He cannot, Israel cannot have its technology fall into Russian hands. If it falls into Russian hands, it goes to Iran. And then Iran, Hezbollah, Hamas get around the Iron Dome. Uh, that is a serious concern. Ukraine rejects that idea. They say there's no chance of that happening. Uh, but that is a concern. So that is certainly the, the level of Israeli technology, even anti-drone technology, um, I think that has to be taken into consideration um, as well. But there's also the question is of Russia is increasingly reliant on Iran's domestic military production, which is a crazy idea that this world right. power is, right. you know, is reliant on a Middle Eastern power's uh, production. But the question is, okay, so what? how's Russia paying for this? Is it just energy? Not likely. Uh, Iran has plenty of energy. What does Iran really want? Either nuclear or military uh, assistance. And I think that is a major concern. We have to figure out what Russia, uh, what with what coin, Russia is paying the Iranians. Right. And definitely um, having a, some sort of a Russian umbrella provides the added armor Iran needs in its operation in the region and, and, and globally. Um, you know, one of the things that comes to mind when it comes to Israel and the Ukraine is a significant aid and assistance provided by officially the government of Israel, Mashav and others, and of course, Israeli civil society organizations to Ukrainian citizens on the ground. We saw field hospitals, we saw other endeavors, Israel and others, Natan. What role did this aid play, if at all, in the relations between both countries? So it, 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 there's no question that it plays a role in the civil relations between the two countries. And I think Ukrainians generally like Israel. I've been there four times since the war started, never had to hide my Jewishness, my Israeliness. Um, and, you know, there, there was 50,000 tech workers working for Israeli companies beforehand. Israel put, they were the only ones to open a field hospital on Ukrainian territory near Lviv. Right. That certainly does its work. Um there was also, yeah, like you said, Jewish organizations around the world. And, and I remember I was walking in Lviv in March, so March 2022. So in the first weeks of the war, and I saw Haredim, ultra-Orthodox, outside the Lviv train station, Israeli flags all over the place. All sorts of people were coming up. They were from United Hatzalah, one of the ambulance rescue organizations. And it was very well received. You know, non-Jewish Ukrainians coming up, kissing the flag, crying. Um, it was really quite a sight. and It was good to see. At the same time, that type of aid it does not even come close to addressing the massive scale of problems. You know, if we had the, the dam uh, attack, which right. has flooded and, and, and polluted waters and, you know, it's fertilizer. And, and the, in Odessa, I think the, the amount of water they need every day, I think it was like 500,000 cubic liters a day just for their drinking water in the Odessa region, which is massive. So when you have Israel or other countries sending, you know, 2,000 bottles of water here and there, it's important. It reaches people, but it, that does not 
even come close to addressing the massive need. It's not Israel's fault, of course. You know, there's much more wealthy and and, and uh, capable organizations, but Israel certainly is doing a lot. There was uh, earlier this month, at the beginning of the month, there was a two-day uh, rehabilitation session in Lviv, where the heads of of Israeli hospitals and four Israeli ministries went to talk about, um, you know, all of Israel's experiences with rehabilitation from war. So I think that's that's also important. But again, the the government, uh, Zelensky's office, they have their their heart set on military technology and and sanctions and things like that. It's, you know, it's um, it's scary to think not just about the current situation and the terrible war, but on all of the rehabilitation efforts that are going to be needed once this war is over and how, you know, a country can be taken decades back when it comes to infrastructure and technology, even in this time and age. Um, in, in this context, Laser, how do you view the visit by Ukrainian First Lady in Israel? Was it considered to be a successful visit? Did it touch at all on the security issue or did it focus on the civilian matters? How do you view it uh, from your position? Sure. I mean, it was, an, it was important that it, it took place and, you know, that it took place from the highest levels in Ukraine. Obviously, it's the First Lady. Yeah, it was an important symbol. It did not touch on the security issues, really. It was about uh, rehab, trauma care, the, the priorities that Zelenska has had throughout the war. Um, I thought it went well, but then Ukrainian officials told me, this is their claim, that Netanyahu himself refused to meet her and sent Sarah Netanyahu, uh, his wife, to meet her for a 15-minute meeting. Prime Minister's office would not comment on that, but that is how the Ukrainians at least are messaging it. So, so it seems like it was less successful uh, than it would have seemed at first blush. You know, I, I have to tell you that thinking about Israel's predicament, I saw a report that Russia was making similar accusations against Israel, summoning um, Israel's ambassador in Moscow for its supposedly pro-Ukrainian stance. How, what are the Russians upset about and how do you view this? Sure. So from the beginning of the war, there's been this Rus Russian line about uh, the need to denazify Ukraine, right? So why was why is the resonance in the, in Russia? There's obviously resonance because the great uh, you know unifying narrative is of the Second World War, the Great Patriotic War, where they they were the ones who who defeated the Nazis, um, and Ukrainians obviously were part of the Soviet effort. They point at uh, you know, there was Ukrainian partisans who were certainly allied with the Nazis. Uh, Ukraine During the war, there was no question there was uh, Ukrainian collaboration um, on local levels. And the city of Lviv was one example. Um, and they point at that. And more recently, Ukrainian nationalism, there has been some elements that have been on the far right slash neo-Nazis. That's what they point at. And they make a big deal out of it and say the current government, which again, Zelensky is Jewish, many of his advisors are Jewish, are essentially neo-Nazis or, you know, and, and there's a need to, to get them out. And they say, therefore, Israel, how could Israel cooperate with these people? Any cooperation with them is betraying Jewish history and is cooperating um, with Nazis. Obviously, Israel has a, has a different view of, of that, and certainly Ukrainians do as well. Um, you, our ambassador in Ukraine, uh, Mikhail Brodsky, he was talking to a Russian language outlet, and he said that these partisans in World War II, what are you going to do? They're Ukrainian heroes. He can understand why they're heroes. And, and you know, it was a pretty innocuous statement. And then the Russians started accusing Israel of, you know, of, of excusing uh, these pro-Nazi figures and, and current sympathy with Nazis in Ukraine. And Israel responded that no one should lecture Israel about this issue. Certainly not, not Russia, but uh, they said no, no one can, can lecture Israel. Because of that, um, Russia's, uh, excuse me, Israel's charge d'affaires, we don't have an ambassador right now, in Moscow, Ronan Kraus was summoned on Tuesday to the foreign ministry to talk about this. Um, again, it's a diplomatic tool. I'm sure it's not going to deeply damage relations, but it shows um, how ser how much it, uh, Russia will push on this issue. Right. Um, quite the predicament for Israel, um, especially if, uh, you know, Israeli slash Jewish assistance to the Russian narrative of, you know, the Nazi uh, regime in the Ukraine will help legitimize the terrible things that happen at the moment, which is something clearly Israel is unwilling to uh, 
partake in. And I'm wondering, we spoke about Russia um, and, and the Ukraine vis-a-vis -vis Israel. Let's talk about the US and the West's um, attitude towards Israel in light of the situation. Naturally, I believe the US and the West would love to see Israel more aligned with them. We heard Yuli Edelstein, the head of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Knesset, actually talking about this issue and saying that you know Israel shouldn't fumble and mumble and needs to have a stronger position on this. How do you see those statements? What do you think is the perception of Israel in the eyes of the U.S. and other players in the West in light of this situation um, moving forward? Sure, I think the West would have liked the whole world to go along with them, and, and you can see how uh, ineffective they have been at, at enlisting the world uh, uh, to their position, whether it's, uh, you know, there's significant pro-Russian sentiment in Africa and, and, and places in the third world. Um, and Israel, it's not pro-Russian at all, but it, like I said, it's a normal position, right? There's right. plenty of countries that are democracies or are very aligned with the West that have not gone along with it because it's not their fight. And I think Israel does not need to make it its fight. There was certainly disappointment. Uh, I speak to EU officials and they, you know, they make a huge deal out of it and talk about this moral failing. If, I, if I'm in a mood to, I turn around and I talk about, okay, what is your, why do you still have an embassy in Iran? You know, that's our issue. And how do you excuse that? And how do you excuse all the relationships? The fact that many of these countries don't have the IRGC on their terrorists or Hezbollah even. Um, I think that is, you know, that is much harder to explain than Israel's position um, on Ukraine. So, yes, it's one of the issues. If you're talking about the U.S.-Israel relationship, which between the two administrations obviously is not great. Netanyahu has not been invited to the White House. Right. Um, the White House has been repeatedly critical of this administration, whether it's for settlement announcements, the judicial reform, they really got involved in this domestic affair and, and hinted that it could harm, uh, you know, Israeli democracy, um, you know, really going beyond the normal uh, standards of, of diplomatic speech. So, yeah, this I'm sure this certainly doesn't help. But since it's so important to the West, it's kind of a trump card Maybe I shouldn't use the word trump card with this administration, but a uh, a card that that he could play. Um, he's but Netanyahu has been invited to Kiev. If he goes to Kiev, I think that might be at least be seen as him, but could really buy some breathing room and some points for him in Europe and in Washington. You know, um, one, one last thing, just to you know understand and thank you again for making all of these super important clarifications for our audience. The, the fact is that the Israeli policy vis-a-vis -vis the Ukraine, when you compare the Netanyahu government and last year's government of the Bennett Lapid, um, it wasn't significantly different, was it? Even though you mentioned at the beginning, like warm, warming up of the relations uh, when Netanyahu assumed office, the Israeli interests have remained the same. It's not a political issue when it comes to this triangle. For sure, for sure, yeah. They, they, the interests are absolutely the same. Uh, this is one of the few issues that Netanyahu praised the previous government for and, and, and lauded their prudence. If anything, Netanyahu has moved the dial a little bit toward Kiev. There was some fear at the beginning in the first weeks of this administration that he would become more pro-Russian. He has a long relationship with Putin. But I think if anything, we can see, especially with the fact that the foreign minister went there and, and, and Lapid never went, uh, right. that, that, that he has moved it a few degrees in Kiev's favor. Do you see in between Beijing and Washington, do you see Prime Minister Netanyahu visiting Kiev? Who knows when either of these will happen? I think it's inevitable that Netanyahu will go to Kiev. Um, the question is when. I do not get the sense that anything has been said yet, uh, but I think he will go and hopefully I'll go with him. And, and last but not least, we remember um, Naftali Bennett's uh, tiny jump into the arena trying to mediate or in between Russia and the Ukraine. Do you see similar appetite with Netanyahu to uh, present himself on the international stage in such a way? No, I think it was uh, an embarrassment, actually, how that turned out for Bennett. It was, he, you know, he really failed. Uh, it was seen as really, you know, not understanding his own position. Uh, Turkey actually did some of the mediation um, that Israel was basically uh, angling for. I don't, th I think uh, Netanyahu is too experienced to put himself out there. I'm sure if he can, he'd be happy to, but to start, you know, making pledges like Bennett did, that didn't look too good for him in the end. Right. Understanding the limitations of your position. Thank you, Laser, for your insights, for your super fascinating perspective. I mean, we all share the hope for quieter times in the world and for an ending mm -hmm. to this terrible atrocities and war in the Ukraine. Um, I want to urge our viewers, you know, for more of this 
wonderful insight. Follow Laser on Twitter, um, Laser underscore Berman. That's Laser underscore Berman on Twitter. Um, you can hear more of this important analysis, not just when it comes to Israel's diplomatic endeavors, but also on Christian affairs and beyond. Laser, it's been wonderful to have you with us. Thank you, Shachar, and I hope we do this again soon. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm sure we will. I'd like to thank you all for watching. And to all, we'll say, stay safe and stay healthy. I'd like to thank our director, Sloan Copeland, JBS's acting CEO, Dara Golub, our technical manager, Michael Paley, transmission manager, John McDevitt, and to our wonderful producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. For JBS, I'm Shahar Azani. Until next time, see you soon. Shalom and Lady Rose.